Hi guys, we're back now for part three of uh, Euclidean space. So for this part, we are going to uh, be talking about the notion of the epsilon ball around a vector or a point in Rn. We're going to be talking about also uh, basically the same idea with a different name, a neighborhood of a point in Rn. And we're going to be talking about open and closed sets. So uh, let's start right in with the notion of this epsilon ball. So here we have a definition. Uh, it says that the epsilon ball around a point or a vector in Rn uh, is this set here. And so let's see what that set is. Let's write the set over here as well. And uh, actually, I didn't write here our standard notation for an epsilon ball, so it probably is a good idea for me to write this over here, because I am going to typically use this notation for the epsilon ball about the vector x of radius epsilon. So it's exactly what the definition says, although I didn't write this notation there. So this is, and now I'm just going to rewrite the definition here. It's the set of all vectors, set of all vectors that satisfy the inequality, uh, and I'm going to write here as y minus x, could be x minus y, they're the same. I wrote it as y minus x, uh, I guess only because it's x that's fixed here. x is a fixed vector, and y is kind of the variable vector that's varying around here in this set. So let's draw a little picture of what's going on here. So so let's say this is a vector x somewhere in Rn. And we're given not only the x is fixed, but the epsilon is also given to us. So that's fixed in here. And so let's say this is epsilon. So in R2, so let's first say we're looking, we're here in R2. In R2, the set for which this is, and let me write here, I'm going to write equal. This is less than, but I'm going to write equal for just a moment because I want to look at the set where this is equal. If I look at the set, you know, not, not, it's not this notation. If I look at the set for which the norm of y minus x, the distance of y from x, the distance between y and x, is exactly epsilon, it's this circle in R2. In R3, it would be a sphere, right? It would be all of the things exactly epsilon units away from the center, x. And we actually use that terminology. We refer to this set, not that notation, we refer to this set as the sphere, even the epsilon sphere, around x of radius epsilon. We don't actually use that sphere very often. Uh, I don't think in the Simon and Bloom book that's even defined or talked about, but uh, it's useful. So. The circle here would be the special case of a sphere in R2. And so the epsilon ball then is all of the points inside the circle in R2, not including the boundary, not including the circle itself. In R3, all the points inside the ball around x of radius epsilon, but not including the sphere itself, not including the boundary. And so you can see why we call it the epsilon ball around x, because in R3, it is a ball. It's a ball that doesn't include its boundary. And of course, uh, we can't picture this in R4 or any n bigger than 3, but analytically, the concept is just the same. So this is our ball of radius epsilon uh, around a vector x. And uh, you can see here, we just use a, an alternative uh, name for it. 
we also call the epsilon ball a neighborhood. So when we say we are looking at a neighborhood of a point x, it's that neighborhood is always going to be an epsilon ball, but we typically use the term neighborhood, and in fact, we typically use the epsilon ball in cases where we think epsilon is small, and often it's in limiting sort of stories, limiting arguments, where the epsilon gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and eventually it's really, really small, and so we use epsilon as our typical notation for a small number, and in this case, a small radius. So a small ball, a neighborhood. So the idea of neighborhood is it's close by. Okay, so a neighborhood around x, ball, around x is just an epsilon ball around x, typically with epsilon a small number. And the next uh, item we have here is uh, the notion of an open set. So we say that a set is open if it contains a neighborhood of each one of its points. So a set, and so let's just say we had a set like this, and let's say that's S, that's an open set if it contains a neighborhood of each of its points. So let me say I could have a point here, and I could have a neighborhood, and that neighborhood of this X is entirely an S. So this set contains a neighborhood of that x. Maybe I have another x that's down here. Well, now I would have to have a very small epsilon, a very small neighborhood, but it would still be the case that the set S contains an entire neighborhood of that point x there. But if the set S includes any of the points on its boundary, such as this point over here, then I've got a problem because every neighborhood, no matter how small of that x, contains points that are not in S. So that would say that if S contains any of the points on its boundary, then it's not an open set because any one of those points, every ball around the point contains points not in S. So no such neighborhood is actually contained in S. Now, that's a little bit informal. Well, the definition of an open set is not informal. That's a formal definition. This notion of points on the boundary, it, we kind of have a pretty good idea intuitively of what we mean there, but I haven't actually written down a definition. That will come later. We'll talk about the boundary, the interior, the exterior. Uh, we'll have a lot of terminology and notions about sets uh, like we have here. But for now, we just want to focus on the notion of uh, a neighborhood or an epsilon ball around a point and the idea that some sets are open sets because no matter what point I take in the set, I can find a neighborhood of the point where the neighborhood itself is entirely in the set. Okay, so that's the idea and the definition, and all we're going to do in the rest of this part three of our Euclidean space lecture is to look at a bunch of examples to get a good, firm grasp of what uh, we mean by an open set. So we will take this off, and we'll do some examples. Okay, now we've got some space back over here, and uh, let's do several examples of uh, open sets, neighborhoods, epsilon balls. So let's start off with uh, our first example. And that's going to be just the real line, just the set R of, uh, of all real numbers. And we are going to be able to see pretty easily that that is an open set. And of course, the reason is that if we take any point in R, any x in R, um, then for any epsilon, no matter how small or how big, the uh, ball of radius epsilon about that x is certainly going to be in R because every subset of R is a subset of R. So R here is playing the role, R1 is playing the role of S, and so 
clearly R is open, let's just say any epsilon greater than zero will do the job. And in fact, that's not true just for R1, just for the reals, that's really true for Rn. So, so the whole space Rn is an open set, <laughs> simple to see. And now I actually uh, left off one thing over here that I should have done, and that is to, uh, to give the definition of a closed set. And so our definition here says a set is closed if its complement is an open set, if it's the complement of an open set. So applying that here, well, what's the complement of Rn? Well, the complement of the whole space is the empty set. So according to this definition here, the empty set must be a closed set, again, according to the definition. So this says this is a closed set. Okay, so uh, I think I pointed out that um, the open sets and closed sets, where these examples here are, are really just trying to see uh, how open sets, closed sets work together. And they don't work in exactly the most obvious way as we're going to see. That hasn't shown up yet. So far, it looks like open sets, closed sets, they're distinct, they're different, just like open door or closed door, not the same thing. Um, but we'll see that things don't work out quite as straightforwardly as they, as it seems like they might. So let's look at a second example here. And the second example is also going to be easy. That is easy to kind of see intuitively. Well, <laughs> this isn't working out so well here. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so we're going to look at the open unit interval in R. And that set is also an open set. And so we want to actually prove that. And so it seems as if that ought to be easy to prove. Certainly if I take any number in the interval 0, 1, it can't be 0, it can't be 1. If I take any number in the, in the interval here, it seems pretty obvious that I can then take a smaller interval of radius epsilon, of width epsilon on each side, uh, and get it to be in the interval. So it seems intuitively obvious, and I, I think it is intuitively obvious, that this is an open set according to our definition. But to actually prove it, analytically, turns out to be just a little bit tricky. It's not quite so easy to, to prove as it is to kind of see it intuitively. So let's see how we go about doing that. So um, what we want to do is we want to show that for any, according to the definition, for any point or number x in the interval, so let's say, let's let x be in the interval 0, 1. And so I, maybe I should stop here for a second and point out that now the interval 0, 1, the open interval from 0 to 1, that's playing the role of S in our definition of an open set. So let's see what this looks like. Let's draw a little picture of this. So let's put our interval down here. Here's 0, here's 1. And let's say this is an arbitrary point x in the interval. And so let's, uh, let's say that, let's note that this, in this subinterval here, is width 1 minus x, and this subinterval here is of width x, and so what I want to do is I want to find an epsilon ball, an epsilon neighborhood, an epsilon interval around x that's entirely contained in the interval here. It's completely obvious that we can do it, but to write it down analytically, I have to actually figure out what that epsilon is going to be, and that's kind of the trick here. So uh, what we're going to do is let epsilon be the smaller of these two 
numbers here. So let's say we want to show, let's go back up here, and let's say that we will prove that there exists an epsilon greater than zero such that the ball of radius epsilon around x is a subset of zero, one, because that's what the definition says we have to do if we're going to prove that the uh, interval is an open set. Um, and notice that what I'm doing here in this proof, we're going to talk about proofs and how to do them, um, kind of strategies for how to go about proving things shortly, perhaps maybe in the next lecture, actually. Uh, but just here, we'll say that I'm starting out with this. And by the way, let's actually do one other thing here. Let's say that I said let x be in here. Well, that's a, just really a shorthand way of saying something like assume. Assume that x is in here. Or suppose x is in here. These are just synonyms, really pretty much the same thing. We just often say let. It's shorter. Um, so when we, we prove this, we have to say, OK, let's take an arbitrary point in the set. And the definition requires that then there has to be some epsilon such that this ball is a subset of the interval. So that's what we have to prove. So what I'm doing is I'm starting out with the, the assumption part here. And I'm already writing down where we have to get to. And what we have to do is kind of fill in the blanks in between these two. That's really what we're doing when we construct a proof here. So, uh, so what we're going to do now is we have to figure out an epsilon that'll work. So let's say let, or assume that, or suppose that we have epsilon equal to the minimum of x and 1 minus x. OK, so over here, that says that since in the picture, in the, 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 the kind of diagrammatic example I did here, clearly 1 minus x is smaller than x. x is bigger than a half. So our epsilon here would be this width and then the same width over here. So this would now be epsilon, and this would be the width epsilon. And of course, it's these two widths because x is bigger than a half. If x was smaller than a half, then the minimum of these two would be x, and I'd be kind of over here on the left side of the interval. So we're going to let epsilon be this. And because that's the case, uh, let's just note that it follows that epsilon is, first, epsilon is greater than 0, because if it turns out to be x, well, x is greater than 0 because x is in the interval here. And if it turns out that epsilon is 1 minus x, well, uh, x is less than 1. So 1 minus x is uh, going to be greater than 0 also. So one thing that we know is epsilon is greater than 0. Um, let's uh, also note that it's got to be the case that epsilon being the minimum of these two is less than or equal to x. Either epsilon is equal to x or it's equal to this, which would then be at least as big as x. And it's also the case that epsilon has to be less than or equal to 1 minus x. If x, if x is the smaller one, then it's still true that x is less than 1 minus x. And if 1 minus x is the smaller one, and epsilon is less than x. And I'm actually going to use both of these. So I'm going to actually put a little rectangle around this. And I'm going to put a little rectangle around this. Because I'm going to use these two inequalities. And I'm going to use these two colors to differentiate them. OK, so we've got epsilon here. And so uh, then we'll say, now we have to show 
What do we have to do to show that this is a subset of the set here? Whenever we want to show that one set is a subset of another, we have to show that every point in this set is actually in this set as well. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to say, suppose we take an arbitrary point in this set, we'll show it's in this set. So let y be in the ball around x of radius epsilon, and then you'll notice from our definition uh, that the epsilon ball is the set of all y's whose norm is, sorry, whose distance from x is less than epsilon. And of course here the norm is just the absolute value. So here we have, uh, let's just say, i.e., same statement, y minus x, absolute value, distance, is uh, less than epsilon. Okay, and so what do we need to do now? We need to show we need to show that the y that we chose here in here is actually also in here. So we have to show that y is in the interval 0, 1. Again, what I'm doing is I'm writing down where we have to get to and then we're going to have to figure out how to fill in the blanks, fill in the space between, assuming this, and using it to prove this. Well, this is the part that actually gets a little tricky, even though this seems kind of obvious. This part here gets a little tricky, and that's because of this absolute value. Now, of course, the absolute value of y minus x is going to be y minus x if that's positive. But the absolute value of y minus x is going to be x minus y if this is negative. So I'm going to separate out those two cases. That one doesn't have to go that way, but in a certain sense, ultimately, that's going to have to happen in the proof. So let's just do that right here. We'll say if y is greater than or equal to x, then uh, one thing will happen. And then down here, we'll put if y is less than or equal to x, what happens? So if y is greater than or equal to x, then uh, the absolute value of y minus x is y minus x. So then we have y minus x is less than epsilon. And uh, if y minus x is less than epsilon, then uh, what do we have? We have y is less than x plus epsilon. Let's put that here. y is less than x plus epsilon. y is also greater than or equal to x. So let's put that here. And x, since it's in the uh, open interval of 0, 1, is uh, larger than 0. So that's bigger than zero. So I've got y larger than zero, which is part of what I want to do. And now x plus epsilon, notice that if I take this minus x and put it over here, I've got x plus epsilon less than or equal to one. So let's say this is uh, x plus epsilon is less than or equal to one. And now I'm going to use this orange here Because what I've done to get this is I've used this inequality here. And let's also note, uh, let me just use yet another color, I guess. Let's note that, uh, let's just note that this inequality here comes from here. y minus x less than epsilon, y is less than x epsilon. Well, that should be x plus epsilon all the way over here. Okay, so indeed, I've got y larger than zero and y less than something that's less than or equal to one. So let's 
So we got where we wanted to get, so long as y is at least as big as x, so long as y is over to this side of x in the diagram here. And so everything is going to work pretty much the same if y is less than or equal to x, but we have this in this case because if y is less than or equal to x, the absolute value of y minus x is x minus y, a positive number. And so uh, let's just parallel what we did here. Let's say, therefore, it is going to be the case that y, if I take the minus y over here, I have y greater than x minus epsilon. So let's say y is greater than x minus epsilon. And that is, just like I did up here, that is going to be from here. And then uh, we have uh, y, uh, uh, we have uh, x minus epsilon is, uh, well, x is greater than or equal to epsilon. So x minus epsilon is greater than or equal to zero. And that comes from this inequality here. Okay, and so finally we want to say that y here is less than or equal to x, because we've assumed that here, and x is less than 1 because x is in the interval from 0 to 1. So we have again, just like in the first case, we have y bigger than 0 and less than 1. So y is in 0, 1, and that completes the proof. So this is actually a proof done in detail, done carefully, of something that seems completely obvious on the, when you think about it kind of geometrically like this. Seems completely obvious, but it turns out it's a little subtle, a little tricky to actually write down an analytical proof. And that happens a lot. That happens all the time. And so this is kind of a good place to start seeing that. Uh, so we have uh, the open interval here is an, actually an open set. And so this is kind of getting filled up over here, so let's take this off and then we'll do several more examples to try to work out how open and closed sets work with one another. Okay, so this is going to go. We'll be back in just a moment. Just a moment.